Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College again. We're going to continue our discussion on pulmonary ventilation with this video, J. So let's take a look at the factors that impact pulmonary ventilation. You see them listed here, there are three. We're going to take a look at resistance, which is going to be a similar discussion as we've had before in the blood vessel chapter. We'll take a look at surface tension again, um, in particularly in the alveoli, and also lung compliance. And we're going to see that surface tension and lung compliance are very much related to one another in this discussion. Remember in the blood vessel chapter, you learned the formula for blood flow. Well, the formula for airflow is identical, except that our pressure A and pressure B is represented by the pressure in the atmosphere versus the pressure in the alveoli, or I should say, uh, subtract these pressures divided by the peripheral resistance. Well, the difference in the atmospheric pressure and alveolar pressure, as you know, at rest, at rest, is going to always be approximately two millimeters of mercury. Remember that if we decrease the pressure in the alveoli by about one millimeter of mercury compared to the atmospheric pressure, we're going to bring in about a half a liter of air. And when we expel air during the process of exhalation or expiration, we're only going to need to increase the pressure by about one millimeter of mercury above the atmospheric pressure. So very small pressure changes allow us to move quite a bit of air, half a liter when we inhale and about a half a liter when we exhale. So what we really need to focus on when we talk about the flow of air is resistance. And when we look at the flow of air, what really impacts resistance the most is going to be friction. Friction is the major non-elastic source of resistance. Remember that, there, that our lungs express quite a bit of elasticity due to the presence of elastic fibers. And of course, these elastic fibers are always going to want to recoil and uh, therefore, in that sense, uh, increase resistance. But we're now going to take a look at friction, which is the major non-elastic source of resistance to airflow. Recall that when we studied the blood vessels, we found that most resistance to the blood flow occurred in the smallest arterioles. In the case of our respiratory tract, we see that most resistance occurs at the level of the medium-sized bronchi. So that's where we see the highest resistance. Maybe I should have specified I was talking about resistance here. After these medium-sized bronchi, we see a rapid drop in resistance. So then drops fast, then resistance drops fast, this should say. And this is due to the fact that after these medium-sized bronchi, we have lots and lots and lots of branching into smaller and smaller bronchi, which eventually become bronchioles, all the way to the terminal bronchioles. So remember the relationship between the flow of blood, or we can apply it here to the flow of air, um, that is the velocity of flow of blood and the velocity of flow of air is inversely related to the total cross-sectional area. We learned that in the case of the blood vessels and we can now apply that relationship here. Now, once we're past the terminal bronchioles and we enter, <clears throat> excuse me, into those structures that participate in gas exchange, we're going to have basically no resistance anymore. Remember, after the terminal bronchioles, we're going to then switch over to the respiratory bronchioles, which are the first structures where gas exchange will occur. Similar principle in the blood vessels, once we reached the capillaries, capillaries were um, leaky enough to where we didn't see much of any um, resistance anymore or very little. Now, when it comes to changing the diameter of our airways, to affect resistance, 
we need to talk about our autonomic nervous system, particularly we need to again revisit the parasympathetic nervous system which always releases acetylcholine uh, or its fibers I should say, while the sympathetic nervous system fibers most often release norepinephrine. In the blood vessels the sympathetic nervous system would always cause vasoconstriction and we did not have any parasympathetic innervation in the case of the blood vessels. So vasoconstriction and dilation was controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. If norepinephrine landed on the blood vessels they would constrict. If no norepinephrine or less norepinephrine landed on the blood vessels they would constrict less and consequently dilate. Well in the respiratory system we see that the sympathetic nervous system actually creates or results in bronchodilation while the parasympathetic nervous system is going to cause bronchoconstriction and of course this is by affecting the smooth muscle in the bronchi. Now sometimes you might get confused about what each branch of the autonomic nervous system does and the best thing is to just put yourself in a situation of stress. Remember your sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight system. So you can put yourself in a situation where you need to run for your life or you're working out really hard. Those are the times of course that you're going to want to breathe heavier and bring in more air. Those are the times you want to see bronchodilation. So therefore stress, sympathetic nervous system, results in bronchodilation and the parasympathetic nervous system is going to do the opposite in other words it is going to cause bronchoconstriction so if you keep that example in mind of you having to run for your life or you're working out really hard you shouldn't be able you shouldn't be confusing the effects of these two nervous systems notice that there are uh, other things that can affect uh, airway resistance by causing bronchoconstriction such as histamine which is why we tend to have to take antihistamines to prevent the bronchoconstriction various things that can irritate the inner lining of our um, respiratory tract of course asthma attacks are famous for um, causing bronchoconstriction and then other things can increase the resistance any kinds of tumors or any kinds of growths are going to affect resistance, any kind of mucus built up, um, any, any kinds of things that cause inflammation, infection, etc. That's going to make it much harder for air to flow through our respiratory tract. Remember what we're focusing on in this video, we're looking at the factors that impact ventilation. We just discussed airway resistance. Let's take a look now at how alveolar surface tension is going to impact um, airway resistance. When we talk about surface tension, the surface tension in the alveoli is created by the presence of water. When we inhale air, that air contains water vapor and by the time it reaches the alveoli it has become a liquid that is water and water molecules have very very strong cohesive forces in the sense that they really really like to stay together they're very attracted to one another and consequently if we have water liquid inside of the alveoli because of the nature the attractive nature of water molecules um, to one another we're going to see that these alveoli are going to have the tendency be, to be as small as possible. So alveolar surface tension causes alveoli to want to be as small as possible. Now that is good for some things and we'll talk more about the importance of surface tension as we go along but the surface tension cannot be too strong to the point that these alveoli cannot at all get bigger to in order for us to bring in fresh air. So what we find is that the type 2 cells that are part of the wall of the alveoli secrete this detergent-like chemical that we refer to as surfactant. 
And what the surfactant does is it reduces the surface tension in the alveoli. It reduces some of those cohesive forces between the water molecules. Babies that are born prematurely do not produce any or not enough of the surfactant because, of course, clearly their little lungs haven't finished developing yet. So what is often done is that surfactant is actually sprayed into the lungs of these little preemies. And this condition of having insufficient levels of surfactant in preemies is referred to as infant respiratory syndrome. Our final factor to discuss that impacts pulmonary ventilation is lung compliance. Remember what the word compliance means, it refers to distending. So lung compliance refers to how well the lungs can distend or stretch essentially. And as you think about it, if we have all of that surface tension in the alveoli, high surface tension is going to make it difficult for the lungs to be compliant. At the same time, we also need to take a look at the tissue of the lungs and ask ourselves how well can it distend that is, how well do, for instance, the elastic fibers and the smooth muscles allow for the lungs to distend, um, along with the thoracic cage that surrounds the lungs. So how distensible are these two regions? For instance, if we take a look at people who suffer from emphysema, and we'll, we'll come back to emphysema uh, later on again, people who suffer from emphysema have actually good lung compliance, meaning their lungs can distend quite well, but they have poor elasticity. In other words, their lungs can distend well, but they have lost a lot of the elasticity of the lungs. So the smoking, for instance, may, which might have caused the emphysema, has um, destroyed quite a bit of the elastic fibers to the point that the lungs cannot recoil very easily. Often people with emphysema have, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, such as emphysema, often they have a barrel-shaped chest, implying that yes, they can distend those lungs easily, but they cannot um, allow them to recoil quite so well. So some of the obvious things that are going to decrease um, the level of lung compliance is when there is scar tissue in the lungs, when there is all kinds of infectious material or uh, mucus buildup, again, making it very difficult for the lungs to distend because anytime we have a lot of fluid, we're going to see those cohesive forces taking over again. If there isn't enough surfactant present in the alveoli, those alveoli are going to want to stay very, very small and it's difficult to pull them apart. But also the thoracic cage can impact uh, the compliance of our lungs. So for instance, if our thoracic cage can't uh, allow for the lungs to distend because there's scar tissue buildup or perhaps the the costal cartilages have become um, calcified or ossified. Perhaps the thoracic cavity is deformed. Maybe there are, again, um, tumors of some sort growing in the thoracic cavity, making it difficult to distend. Perhaps the muscles in between the ribs, the intercostal muscles, have become paralyzed, uh, making it difficult for the rib cage to expand. So we've reached the end of this video in which we have focused on the three factors that can impact pulmonary ventilation. And that is airway resistance, the surface tension in the alveoli, and lung compliance. We have one more video to go to finish our discussion on pulmonary ventilation.